Hello. Um, my name is Maciej Kruszacki. I'm a product manager working on Kubernetes scalability. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shyam Jirigunta. I'm working on the Kubernetes project for a little more than two years, and I focus on scalability and performance aspects of the project. And I'm an active member of the SIG Scalability. Some of you would know me by that GitHub or Slack handle. And uh, maybe as so some folks are grabbing some uh, seats, a quick maybe demographics check. Who in the room is a user of Kubernetes and you're running your own clusters? Cool, yeah, so it looks like half at least. And uh, who among you is running clusters of 1,000 nodes or more? Okay, and 2,000, anyone? Oh, just two hands. So 3,000? Four, no? Okay. Uh, anyone among those of you who did not raise their hands, is anyone considering it or planning that you will run such large workloads in the future? Ah, cool. That's actually more than I expected. Cool. If you want, it would be great if you could also network a bit then uh, after the session. Um, but now let's maybe then move to, to what we prepared to do uh, today for you with Xiam. Uh, so we will be talking about scalability of Kubernetes and uh, we will cover how you should think about it and what are the current limits and then what does it actually mean for you. So first, maybe with a little bit of background, um, why, why we prepared this, why we prepared this material. So we are getting quite a lot of questions uh, from the community, from developers, from users of Kubernetes on what does it actually mean that Kubernetes scales? What's the definition of scalability in the context of this product? Uh, what are the limits? Why, even though I'm running a, a cluster that is smaller than 5,000 nodes, I'm still hitting scalability limits? and um, why uh, workloads that are very similar to mine are not actually part of uh, testing um, of, uh, of from scala scalability perspective. And to respond to these questions and to also many other that we had, we ran a study to understand and document how uh, Kubernetes uh, behaves when you push its scale to the limits and uh, give some guidance to, um, to folks on how they should uh, work with large-scale Kubernetes um, uh, configurations. Uh, so uh, we documented the outcomes of the study, we consolidated it with also uh, some experience and, uh, and the work that we did before and uh, with uh, Kubernetes users and with development of the uh, product. And um, uh, through this presentation, we would like to explain to you how, um, how you should model scalab scalab Kubernetes configurations from scalability perspective, how to think about it, how to plan your architecture, how to think about it from your features development perspective. Um, and um, they will describe to you what are the current known limits of scalability of Kubernetes. And uh, we'll also give you some additional guidance on how you should uh, interact with the um, uh, SIG scalability and uh, how to go about these limits and how to push them forward and uh, expand them. So maybe first, uh, uh, let's talk what does it actually mean that Kubernetes scales and how to define it. So first important misconception is that it's a single number. So it's not. Uh, we very frequently in our materials and in the conversations, we're using the number of nodes as a proxy or a simplification of, what, of the scale and complexity of your cluster. And in many cases, actually, that's good enough. So uh, if you fit into this range, uh, you will not run into trouble. But there are situations when it's actually not a detailed enough definition of scalability of Kubernetes. And you need to double click into it and get to the next level of complexity of uh, description of your configuration to make sure that uh, you're not uh, pushing yourself, pushing your cluster and your workloads beyond the, the limits of, uh, of what currently Kubernetes can do. So um, a better way to think about scalability of Kubernetes is that within all possible configurations uh, of your cluster, there is a cube which wraps uh, an envelope of those configurations which will offer you good stability and good performance. Um, and as long as you are within that envelope, within the limits of scalability on, um, on multiple dimensions, you are safe. You can say that um, uh, you are within the scalability limits and you will not run into any trouble, neither from performance perspective, nor from stability of the cluster. 
Uh, one may be note the, uh, the, the dimensions that we're showing here on the slide, these are examples. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, in the next slides, we'll talk a bit more about how to think about them and which ones are most relevant that you should consider when architecting or developing features. It's, yeah. So first, let's uh, spend a couple of minutes talking what are the properties of uh, this envelope and of this cube that defines scalability limits of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so first, it's not actually a cube. Um, by that, we mean that the dimensions that uh, describe your configuration, uh, they are not independent. And um, you may run into a situation that if on one dimension you have a limit A, on another dimension you have a limit B, and uh, you max out on both of those dimensions with your configuration, then it's probable that um, your cluster will be already outside of the uh, scalability envelope and you, will, uh, you might run then into trouble. Uh, even more, uh, the shape of the envelope is not convex. So taking a more conservative approach and going for uh, averages of A and B uh, so that you stick somewhat in the middle on both of these dimensions still might take you to outside of, uh, outside of the, the envelope and um, you will breach the, the scalability limits of, of Kubernetes. Uh, next property. Now we have it. So, and the next property uh, that is very important for you to take into consideration, when, especially when designing uh, systems that run on Kubernetes, is the fact that this envelope tapers as you stretch it on each of these dimensions. So, if you should be very cautious in pushing Kubernetes into its limits on too many dimensions at the same time. Uh, this leads to situations. Uh, so, the way that you should think about it is that if you, for example, uh, run um, a 5,000 node cluster, you will have less freedom and less space uh, for, for your scale on other dimensions that describe uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and at the same time, it actually might mean, and it is more surprising to many folks that run workloads on Kubernetes, even on very small clusters like five nodes, if you stretch on other dimensions, uh, like for example, the number of pods by node, you might run into scale problems too. Thanks, Manchik. <clears throat> so the next property is about the boundedness of this envelope. So what that really means is you cannot push arbitrarily on any given dimension, even if you keep all the other dimensions at the minimum. And the reason for this is primarily a limit on the size of HCD. And typically, when you're trying to push along some particular dimension, you're increasing the HCD space usage. So we came up with this really crude estimate for the number of objects that can be in HCD, assuming the size of HCD is 4 GB, and that estimate is 300,000 objects, which includes both your built-in API objects and CIDs. But it's a really crude estimate, and the reason why I say that is it does not account for factors like the sizes of these objects and also how many revisions of these objects exist, which can significantly affect the, your HCD space usage. But you can use this as a simplistic idea. Uh, thanks. So the final and my most favorite property is about the decomposability of this envelope. Some of you might have figured out by now that the number of faces of this envelope is exponential in the number of dimensions, which makes it really hard to compute all of those faces. But fortunately, there is a good amount of independence between groups of these dimensions, which lets us break this down into smaller, lower dimensional envelopes. And each of those small envelopes is going to represent some kind of a constraint in our system. Uh, before, uh, so yeah, so we'll go ahead and look at some of the small envelopes, especially like for Kubernetes. Uh, but I want to make a few things clear before we actually look into those limits. The first thing is that we are going to, the limits that we're going to talk about here are purely specific to Kubernetes control plane. So these do not have anything to do with the cloud provider. These come basically out of the Kubernetes design. There may be some limits that come 
from the underlying infrastructure of your cluster, but here we are going to only talk about the Kubernetes plane limits. Um, yeah, and these limits don't form an exhaustive list. These are just the ones we've discovered so far. So this will likely change over time. Uh, and also, they, they, they basically form a rough sketch of what is our idea of um, safe configurations. And this is based on primarily scalability tests that Six Scalability has been doing in some of the user cases. In practice, you may be able to actually go push beyond some of these limits. We try to be conservative at a few places, and we're making recommendations based on based on things that you've tested on upstream officially. But you may be actually be able to push beyond these limits. And even it's possible that within these limits, by doing some really peculiar things or trying out some different kinds of configurations, you can screw up. So in general, like use discretion. And if you have any questions, like please feel free to reach out to us. Six Scalability is very happy to answer such questions. So the next limit, or the first limit, is actually the number of nodes versus the number of pods that you can put on a node, which a lot of you may also call as pod density. And you see on the screen a graph, and there is a green shaded region, which basically represents our scalability envelope. And it's bounded by three uh, limits. There is a limit on the x-axis, there is a limit on the y-axis, and there is a limit which is a function of the x and the y-axis, which in this case is the curve that you can see. Now, uh, let's talk about each of these limits individually. So the first one is the limit on the x-axis of 5,000 that you can see for the number of nodes. And this is the officially tested limit, and this is what we test for in upstream Kubernetes for every release as part of six scalability validation process that we do. Um, so you might want to go beyond this, but then um, I've heard of some exp experiments where people try to push further beyond this, but this is what we officially recommend, this is what we test for. Um, and yeah, it's also uh, mentioned in the official Kubernetes documentation. Now, the limit on the y-axis, which is the number of pods per node, is 110. This, again, is an official limit and something we scale test for. Also, by default, in Kubernetes, uh, kubelets are provided with a max pods argument of 110, which doesn't let you start more than these. If you try to go further beyond this, you try to run more number of pods on your node, then the load on your kubelet and Docker is going to increase, and their responsiveness can fall down. The third limit, which is the curve, uh, which in this case is basically a product of the x and the y axis, which gives you the total number of pods ac across your cluster, is uh, limited to 150,000 pods, which is again something we have scale tested for. Uh, and the reason we keep it down to that limit and don't go further is as you, as you try to create more and more number of pods, you are likely going to increase the load on the API server and its CD. You're going to create a lot of activity in the cluster, which can overload your master. There are a couple, there's a note I want to make here uh, that the limit when I said the number of pods is 110 per node, you need to keep in mind that you, the, there is an assumption that the number of containers that you can have in a pod is not too high. So it's not more than two on an average because if you have too many containers, that can also create issues because there is some fixed amount of cost that Kubelet and Docker have to bear per container, and that rises. So let's go to the next limit. Uh, this one is about the number of services versus the size of your services, which is typically the number of pods that are there in your service. Here also you see a very similar kind of a limit the similar pattern of a limit on the x-axis, a limit on the y-axis, and a limit on the function of x and y-axis. Um, so here we're going to talk about uh, cluster IP services, and I'm not going to step into the domain of cloud provider-based load balancers because that is, like I said earlier, something cloud provider dependent and can change from provider to provider. So I'm purely going to stick to the internal uh, service load balancing mechanism in Kubernetes. Uh, 
Now, uh, you can see that there's a limit of 10,000 services on the x-axis. This is, again, something we've tested for in, uh, uh, in 6 scalability I guess, as part of our upstream Kubernetes scale testing. This limit mainly arises because of IP tables. Whenever you add a new service, when you create a new service, uh, you add a rule to the cube SVC IP tables chain. And this means that when, when you have too many uh, services, the size of this chain increases, which affects your IP tables performance in two ways. The first is basically the performance of IP tables operations themselves, which is IP tables save and restore. It takes more time uh, to do those operations when this chain increases. And the second is packet routing performance, which also falls down for IP tables with, as there are more number of rules to evaluate. So 10,000 is something which is a good estimate for this limit. Um, and the limit on the y-axis of 250 uh, that you can see for the size of the service arises due to the fact that endpoints, the way it is designed in Kubernetes currently, the endpoints API is quadratic in the number of endpoints. So whenever you add a new pod to a service, you're going to recalculate the whole endpoints object for the service, add a new pod, a new IP entry to this object, and then post it over to all your queue proxies. So this really creates a very quadratic kind of traffic. So it's, we recommend to not have two big services because then your control plane can get overloaded because of endpoints traffic. But again, this is not a hard limit. 250 is not a hard limit. You can try to push further, but just make sure that if you're trying to create too many services which are big, try to have fewer number of, uh, I mean, when you're trying to create services that are bigger than this, try to have fewer number of those services. So you can see a configuration on, uh, on a note that I mentioned on the right side, which is a configuration we've tested for. So what we do is we test with a really large number of backends, but we have majority of those backends as part of small services, a few of them which are part of medium services, and a very few of them which are part of large services. So this is something which kind of works well in practice. So yeah, that's basically it. OK. Uh, sure. Uh, what do you mean? You mean IPVS? Yeah, not, not the one based on, uh... OK, so that, that's a really interesting question. Can I get back to that towards the end of the session? Because I really want to talk about that. So, so um, yeah, the next limit is about the number of services you can have per namespace. Here you can see that on the y-axis, you don't actually have any limit, because you can just have as many number of namespaces that you want. But the more important one is the limit on the x-axis of 5,000 services per namespace. And the reason for this is that in Kubernetes, whenever you create a pod in a namespace, as part of the downstream API, you populate the pod with a bunch of environmental variables for every single service that has been created in that namespace. And when you go beyond a threshold, which is 5,000, the pod starts to crash because the kernel cannot load the process into memory because there's just not enough space in the buffer for the process which holds environment variables. So you want to make sure that uh, this is satisfied. And um, if I'm not wrong, like in Kubernetes release 1.13, we have uh, a change which makes it possible to have service-linked environment variables optional. So you can mention it in your pod spec and say that please don't mount my pod with environmental variables, which, which kind of uh, gets us over this limitation. And, and the curve that you see is basically just the product of both, which is the total number of services. And that we already saw earlier has to be limited to less than 10,000. Cool. Pod churn. This is something which has been asked over again and again by so many people, and so many users are interested. Um, in this metric. So, so pod churn is defined as the total uh, or, or the number of pod creates, updates, or deletes that you can do per second. And in Kubernetes, we by default li limit this to 20 per second. And the reason why that limit arises is basically a limit on the QPS for the controller manager. 
So the controller manager, by default, cannot make more than 20 calls to the API server per second, which basically limits your controllers that, 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 that take care of these create, update, and delete operations. But there are a few caveats uh, based on which you can kind of go above or be below this threshold. I just mentioned a few here. So for instance, if you're going to create pods manually, which I don't think is a very uh, common use case, but if you're going to do that, then you basically bypass the controller manager and you can have a very high rate of pod creations. Um, and for deletions, if you're going to depend on the Kubernetes garbage collector to delete your orphan pods, then you actually don't ha have even a lower limit of 10 per second because the way the garbage collector works right now in Kubernetes is it makes two API calls for deleting a single object. So that basically means um, you can only achieve a throughput of 10 per second for deletes. And in general, when, uh, like I said earlier, if you have pods that are part of really big services, then pod churn can create a lot of endpoints traffic because of this massive endpoints objects. And that can overload your uh, control plane. And as a result, you may not actually be able to achieve the churn of 20 per second safely. Cool. Um, next. Yeah, so this limit is about the number of nodes versus the number of configs you can have per node. So the number of configs that uh, per node is basically the total number of secrets and config maps that a node needs in order to be able to start its pods. So the way it works uh, until release 1.11 is Kubelet periodically goes and, uh, and fetches these uh, configs and secret maps. Um, yeah. So so. Here, the limit on the x-axis of 5,000 nodes is something we already talked about before. Uh, the limit on the y-axis is interesting. So we say that the number of configs per node can be more than 200, and this limit is basically because of Kubelet's uh, API QPS limitation. And Kubelet, by default, is configured to not have more than this QPS. So it makes it hard for it to refresh periodically the secrets and config maps, because it has to make get calls to the API server. The, the, the curve here represents the product of both, which basically is the aggregate number of configs that are needed across all your nodes. Um, and this we limit to 150,000. The reason being that, uh, just now the thing that I told you, that Kubelet needs to make periodic uh, calls and the, 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 the bulk of these get secrets and config map calls in your cluster becomes so big that your that your master can get overloaded because of this so uh, luckily the good news is this limitation does not exist anymore starting from release 1.12 the reason is because we moved kubelet from periodically polling configs to watching them and watching is much lightweight as compared to uh, polling and it's kind of a design principle for kubernetes too have watching wherever possible instead of polling. Uh, but if you're running a cluster that's below 1.12, so up until 1.11, and you want to mitigate this uh, limitation to some extent, you can try to co-locate your pods, similar pods onto fewer nodes, so that only fewer nodes need, the, need those configs and secrets. Um, or another recommendation is to turn off the default service account token mounting for your pod. This is basically uh, the default in Kubernetes that the pod is mounted with the secret corresponding to the namespace's identity so that it's able to talk to the API server, which basically adds one extra secret for a pod. And it basically affects this limit. So if possible, you don't, if your pods don't need namespace-based identity or they don't need to talk to the API server, then consider turning this off totally. Uh, so the question is, what is the limit for the Kubelet QPS in 1.11 or before? I believe the limit is uh, 200 or actually, no, I think it's five, which is per second, and this basically shows per 
minute refresh rate. I think it's five, but like I, I need to check that. I'm not 100% sure. Next slide. So uh, this limit is across the number of namespaces versus the number of pods you can have per namespace. The limit on the x-axis of 10,000 namespaces arises basically because of what I've just talked about earlier, that pods are mounted with namespace secrets, and that increases the get secrets uh, traffic. But again, because Kubelet moved to watching secrets, this limit on the x-axis doesn't exist anymore, starting from release 1.12. Um, the interesting limit, which is the y-axis limit of 3,000 pods per namespace, it is not a hard limit. It is something we've empirically observed in our scalability tests that as you have more and more number of pods in your namespace, the responsiveness of your controllers can go down because a lot of reconciliation loops in controllers depend, go through all the pods of a particular namespace, which can kind of make things a bit slower. So this is a recommendation. You probably can go higher or you likely can go higher than this, but if possible, try to break your pods into multiple namespaces. Um, yeah. And, and the, uh, the, the curve, which is the product of both, which is the total number of pods, is limited to 150,000. This is what we talked about earlier already. Let's go to the next limit. Oh, that's all. <laughs> so, with, um, so one thing I want to say is like with, with the knowledge of, uh, a, a, with a better perspective of what scalability really is and with the knowledge of these limits, uh, we hope that you should be able to make more informed choices while architecting your workloads. But if you have any questions, like you can always reach out to us. Uh, I'll pass it on to yeah. Patrick. Uh, and just uh, to add to what Shiam said, uh, a couple of uh, remarks in terms of um, watchouts for you. Uh, one is that if you are a, a Kubernetes developer and you're building feature features um, and improvements, please make sure that you test them from scalability perspective. On six site on GitHub, you can find instructions in the whole process, how to go about it and how to test and which tests to use when. Um, sca scalability is a horizontal concept, so it's not uh, uh, in the hands of a single special interest group to, to make sure that uh, Kubernetes scales. It is in the, uh, it, it is a topic for all of the teams working on improvements, both to make sure that we maintain the existing scalability and that we push the limits further. Uh, secondly, if you are a Kubernetes user, please make sure that you account for scalability tests in your uh, projects when you're architecting uh, your infrastructure and your um, systems. Uh, this is because um, you may have certain specific aspects of your configuration that will change the shape of this envelope. Uh, there might be topics associated with your specific infrastructure, networking, security, and other that may be affecting your, um, uh, the scalability limits that would apply to your specific system. So please make sure that you test it. And uh, third uh, is that please um, uh, stay in touch with us, with the whole team working on scalability. Uh, we need both engaged um, developers who are building features, uh, who would collaborate with uh, SIG scalability to make sure that uh, limits are maintained and expanded. And maybe even more importantly, we need users who want to run workloads which are beyond the current um, scalability envelope, who would be interested in collaborating with us in pushing those limits. Uh, so uh, on this slide, we put key uh, contact channels uh, to, to get in touch with us. You can download the presentation from conference's website, and we'll be happy to take your questions or connect here in the room or later on in our booths. Thank you. Oh, have a question. Maybe let's start from IPv as well. Okay, yeah. Uh, someone had a question about IPvS. Oh, yeah. Um, so yes, we know IPvS uh, performs better than IP tables because it has a better implementation of these rules. I think it's based on hash tables. Um, but we haven't yet tested for IPvS for scale testing, but we do expect it to show a lot of improvement over the performance. Um, that's a very good question. So 
I don't have too much expertise in storage, but I can definitely connect with you with someone from the storage team. Um, there are some recommendations that f I know of storage, which are like kind of very cloud provider specific limits because like some, not on the Kubernetes level, I'm aware of none, but like I'll maybe reach out to you with someone from SIG storage. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, uh, if I can explain the formula on the number summation of the number of configs per node, and the answer is yes, I can explain. And it is, <laughs> it is, it is basically the sum of the number of configs that each node needs across all the nodes. So node A needs some number of configs, right? Some number of secrets and config maps for for the pods that run on that node. It's summation of this across all your nodes in the cluster. Yeah? Yes, uh, it's not exactly the number of configs in use because like, if there are multiple pods needing the same config on multiple nodes, then it's repetitive. So I had a question about this case, the results. This might be because I might have missed part of the conference or I'm in the talk. So uh, when you arrive at the graphs, what was your testing mind? Did you test across all of the vendors? Um, so the question is, what has this been tested against? I, I know that it's a representation of Kubernetes, I mean, a vendor agnostic Kubernetes uh, scalability limits, but right. to test it, or did you use all the vendors? No, so this wasn't run against all the vendors. Okay. So a lot of our upstream testing as it stands today has been done on GC. Not GKE, on GCE. Okay. Yeah, majority of this was, was done on GC, and so yeah. But some some parts of it are done on Kubemark, which is kind of a simulated Kubernetes environment, which is kind of independent of uh, the vendor. So. so if I could jump here for a second, so that yeah. was really great. Thank you guys. I'm one of the co-chairs for Six Scalability. Um, I work for AWS. Uh, Sham has just joined the AWS team as well, and one of the things we're working on is uh, improving the six scalability coverage um, on AWS. Um, uh, I, I've been involved in Kubernetes since before the 1.0 time frame, um, and uh, my team at Samsung, we were one of the first teams to be running like multi thousand node clusters in production, and we were doing a lot of that on AWS. And so it's very interesting. We see that there are um, because of the different characteristics underlying the different cloud providers, you actually will find different bugs at different times, and so um, <coughs> that's an area that we're uh, doing a lot of work uh, going forward on. So it would require other representatives of vendors to come forward and join Six Scalability? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. So uh, I think, uh, I think uh, on Six Scalability, the Six Scalability meetings every week is almost always somebody from Google and someone from Amazon, so we work very closely together in this area. And in general, like at Six Scalability, we're like really happy to take your contributions and your input. If you have had some experiences with some of your scalability tests uh, on your own in your own production environment, we're always happy to hear about it. And indeed, we kind of seek manpower in this SIG because it's kind of very niche right now. And yeah, like like uh, IPVS testing, we'd love to have someone come and help us do a bunch of testing. On yes, that. because it just doesn't scale too well that like, uh, a single SIG is like testing for every single feature across every single vertical, so. So the question is, are there some tests in the conformance suite uh, that someone can run as a vendor? And I'm assuming it's in the context of scalability tests. So the answer is right now we don't. And this is a discussion we've been having in the past with a bunch of people like, if we should start involving scalability tests as part of the conformance suite. This is an ongoing discussion. There's a debate. But you should, you should mention Kubemark, because that is a useful thing for people to, a useful tool for people who want to do some scale testing in their own environments. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Bob. So Kubemark, like, uh, like I was saying earlier, it's kind of a simulated Kubernetes cluster that you can, you can basically run a large simulated cluster on just a few nodes, with the nodes, node part of the cluster hollowed out, but your control plane being real. It's something that you can test uh, even locally. Yeah. One thing that uh, you didn't mention, I'm sure it's complicated, but which, which of these can 
constraints can you do better on by, say, adding more machines, adding more memory? Which with parts of the controller manager API server are scalable vertically and horizontally? OK, uh, that's a very good question. So the question is, uh, what are things that can be, what are some of the limits that can be improved, or how they can be improved by throwing more resources at some components? Uh, it really depends on the limit, the specific limit that you're talking about. For instance, the pod churn that I was talking about, it's a, it's a QPS limit on controller, so you can try to change the default of the controller, but you have to be careful about the resources your master has, because when you give it higher QPS, there is more stuff that's happening within the master, so you also have to scale it vertically. And there are other things like the number of nodes. If you want to increase it, you probably, uh, it makes sense to vertically scale your control plane. But yeah, in general, the answer is uh, a bit complicated and it depends on the particular limit in question. But what is QPS? QPS? Queries per second. So it's basically the limit on the Kubernetes components to talk to the API server. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, just to repeat the question, the question is uh, if we have uh, some kind of knowledge or have we tested anything with scalability of cron jobs? No, we haven't really done that. Like, um, yeah, but I'm not surprised by the thing you say about having too many cron jobs can uh, affect your controllers because of too many calls. But if you're doing some testing with cron jobs, like, please reach out to us and tell us any limits that you discover. We want to have a common knowledge of scalability. Of, like, okay. Um, so the question is, if there are a lot of config maps that have become stale over time and they haven't been cleaned up, does that affect performance? The answer is, if they are stale and not really being used by anyone, they just lie around wasting their CD space. But otherwise, they, sh they shouldn't really affect performance. Uh, so the question is, uh, if I can tell anything more about the master configuration used for these uh, scale tests. Um, so there is a resource on the community repository under SIG scalability, which talks about uh, the recommended configurations for our scale tests. Uh, but I believe these particular limits have been tested with 64 cores and of, of something more than 100 gigs of memory and uh, per master. Yeah, so I'm talking about the master, by the way, sorry. So the, this testing was done both with the single master and under HA, which is three masters, yes. Uh, the number of pods per node, the question is the number of pods per node, was that independent of hardware? So what hardware are you talking about? The hardware for the nodes, or? The hardware for the nodes, yes. Because Intel's got, you know, 100 VCPUs. So these tests are run with a super minimal container that does almost nothing. Yes. So the only reason for the nodes to be in the network is just to provide, basically, the Kubla traffic back to the control plane. They're, these tests don't do anything that is, like, cross-node or test the performance of the node. That's actually the domain of the SIG node group that works in that area. So this is one of those places where some of the responsibility is sort of distributed among different teams within the Kubernetes So were they for the control plane nodes? So these are for worker nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, like to throw some light on this. We basically take a really small node and run pause pods on them, which like Bob said, do nothing. And they're like given very minimal resource requests. So like few milli cores and like very little memory and you just start 
them on the node. This is to test the control plane scalability for the node, which is Kubelet, Docker, and other stuff. We don't actually go into application space, which is like, what exactly are those containers doing? And stuff like that. The short answer would be that getting a larger node or a more powerful node would not improve that 110 limit. That's right. That's the, that's the in some cases, in some cases, it actually I mean, you try, can. You need to work out on the limits also. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, sure. yeah. Uh, so the question is, are there some guidelines on how to scale or provide some different configuration for the control plane so that we support larger limits on the... Right. Yes. Uh, no, so... So I think, strictly speaking, that falls under the purview of SIG auto-scaling, which basically takes care of like uh, dynamically changing the resource requests of your, your user space pods or even the control space pods based on usage. We basically try to stress everything and like give some really maximal values to each of these and like test how, I mean, if we give enough resources, how much can we push on each of these fronts? But Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are two parts of this problem. There's like auto scaling of your uh, application pods, and but you seem to be more interested in auto scaling of the control plane pods. Um, yes, I mean, there are like kind of two different problems, but there probably are some common things among both of those. So to know about what are the things that you need to push to be able to support higher limits, you can come to scalability and to know about how to increase dynamically and when to change uh, the resource requests of your pods or um, what metrics to autoscale on. I think autoscaling is the better thing to reach out for. Uh, so, yeah, so the question is, why does endpoints traffic increase quadratically with the number of backends? It's basically because of the way the API is designed right now. We, the endpoints object for a service is basically, I mean, at a high level, a list of all the IPs of pods that are part of the service. And whenever a new pod comes up, you basically add one entry and update this object. So instead of maintaining individual endpoints as separate objects, you update this whole thing and patch this whole thing, which basically means if they are added n times, then it's n squared bulk of calls. Uh, okay, maybe let's take this uh, offline because I think we're out of time.